Welcome everybody on board today. Thank you for coming. I want to start in right away with um, some of the questions that you have asked, although it did strike me that, and again, I didn't give you a ton of time. Um, I, I will tell you a couple of things. First of all, I dropped my computer, um, not this one. I, um, I, I had, you know, a, a different one that I used for, for working. And, um, and that's meant I've had to switch to this new computer, which always takes a ton of time. So I'm running a little bit behind on that. But also, as you know, I was sick last week. We had come off the road. And as usual, when you do something like that, um, at least for me anyway, I find I get sick. So I was sick last week. And uh, now I am not on the road until March and I am just trying to clean out stuff and I'm getting enough sleep and I feel great. So you guys are all in trouble today. Um, let me start in with um, the the question that everybody keeps asking and that I need to, um, you know, as you know, I've been playing around on Instagram. Oh, by the way, that's the other thing. I am now reading these letters, not these letters, not the, these talks, but I'm reading my letters um, on, uh, we're calling it a podcast, but I always thought a podcast was like when you had guests. There are no guests, at least not yet and no immediate plans to put any guests on there. I'm simply reading the letters. They are available on Substack, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Overlord, or whatever the other one is. It isn't that, I know. Um, any place you get your podcasts, they're free. There's no advertising, but so go ahead and, and tell your friends about that, um, if you would, because it'll keep me enthusiastic about doing them. It's kind of early in the morning, and I got to cross the harbor, so it's... Um, my enthusiasm has been under control on these 16 degree mornings. Anyway, so you've been asking and everybody is talking about <coughs> um, a challenger to President Joe Biden. And just speaking as a political historian, one of the things that frustrates me to know and when I hear that is the people making those arguments clearly know nothing about political history because the last thing one does in a party that has an incumbent is to challenge that incumbent. That's almost always a signal that the party is in real trouble. Think, for example, of Gerald Ford uh, when he was challenged in 1976 by Ronald Reagan. Now, now remember, Reagan's going to run in 1980 and win, but in 76, he challenged Ford, the, the incumbent president, for um, for the nomination, and of course Ford ended up losing that election. And I could just go down through the through the ranks here talking about that. So first of all, it isn't done because it only, it shows a severe split in the party, and and the truth is the Democrats are thrilled to be behind Biden. He's had an extraordinarily successful presidency. So first of all, they wouldn't do that. But stop even going that far. If you think about where we are in politics right now, the Republican Party is in the middle of a civil war. And it is a, I mean, they're, they're literally, the Trump people are physically threatening those who are not on the Trump, Trump team, those people who are not on the Trump team and are trying to regain control of the Republican Party are trying to undercut the Trump side. It is a complete mess on the Republican side. So the idea that the Democrats would want to do that, there's an old adage in, in politics that says, you know, whenever you your, your, your rivals or your opponents are beating themselves up, just stand back. So the idea that the Democrats would also want to jump into uh, a civil war is just bonkers from anybody who studies politics. And the, the other thing that, that jumps out to me that nobody else is really talking about, and that is that it is true that Joe Biden is old and that the people that are being talked about as a replacement for him are significantly younger. The Democrats have quite a deep bench right now. But also, by definition, the reason that the Republicans are going after Biden's age is because they have nothing else. They have looked for years now to try and come up with a scandal. And at this point, even they are admitting they don't think they're going to, to vote to impeach him because there is no there there. The, the chief witness for James Comer's House Oversight Committee turns out to um, now to be under indictment himself for lying and having made that up. You know, their stories keep falling apart. So what they have on on Biden is age now, the, which is undeniable. He's he's an older man. I have spoken here before about the fact that I have have talked to him at length in close proximity and he's fine. He's really fine. I mean, he's he's smart. He knows a lot. He knows how things operate. And, you know, one of the things that, that people who are really good at politics do 
is they see the story that's not there, if you will. And I try and do this all the time. What are people not saying? And that's actually kind of hard to do. And he's always on that every time, um, always looking at the whole picture. So that's not really his, his brain is not a concern. The age issue is very much there. Now, anybody that the Democrats tried to replace him with would, by definition, have skeletons in their closet because they have not been vetted for 50 years on the public stage. So anybody who thinks that anybody would step into Biden's place is going to be this great miracle worker is is simply, I think, that the places I'm seeing it from are people who either wish the Democrats ill or who are bored because the Democrats right now are boring. They're just getting the job done and that's not exciting. I don't know about you, I'm quite I'm quite thrilled when nothing happens these days. But I think the places you're seeing it come from are right now uh, people who would like to see more drama on the Democratic side because they 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 they're bored. You know, they they want more stuff to put in their in their papers. And and not everybody. Um, you know, it's funny. I I truly love to watch the mechanics of how the government plays out. I find that absolutely fascinating. But I'm the first to admit I'm one of the few who feels that way. And you can see reporters being like, come on, give me a cool story like Biden's age instead of making me read a 350 page document to say, oh, look, Biden didn't do anything wrong. So anyway, let's get that one out of the way. But um what about um, a third party? Somebody wrote to me the other day and said, well, I know you hate third parties. And that's actually not true at all. Um, third parties have a function in a democratic society. And, and by the way, I always talk about two parties in the United States because that's what we've had for so long. Um, that does not mean I'm an advocate of two, a two-party system. I'm an advocate of anything but a one-party system. In the United States, the two parties have traditionally been coalitions. So even though there are only two parties, they have many voices in them. And you can see this in the way, for example, that political platforms are written at a convention where, for example, in uh, 2020, Pete Buttigieg, for example, got certain things and he got the portfolio of transportation and, you know, Amy Klobuchar got some stuff and um, Kamala Harris got some stuff and so on. That's actually how it's been done in the United States. It doesn't have to be. It's easier for us because of the way the rest of our system is set up, that a party has to be able to cover all bases, as we currently have it, all bases of the government if it takes power. So in other countries, you can have a coalition where one party is really good on managing, let's say, transportation, and somebody else might be very good at managing, say, finances. In the United States, the parties have to cover all those things. So it's harder for a third party to rise. That being said, a third party in the United States has a crucially important role. Third parties uh, force the major parties to recognize issues that they might not otherwise. So, for example, the Populist Party in the late 19th century embraced a whole bunch of reforms to American democracy that neither major political party really wanted to uh, to grapple with until it turned out that the populists could, in fact, win elections, and a lot of them, at which point what they wanted really got adopted by both major parties and became law um, you know, by at least 1912. So, or 1917, I guess. So the idea that third parties are crucially important to our system really holds that they introduce topics that the major parties don't really want to touch. That being said, there are crucial elections in which third parties are disastrous because they bleed enough party, enough power from, um, from the, the two major parties are, are worlds apart on some issue and they bleed members of the, the more progressive side away so that they, they can't take power. And the great example of this in our history, I mean, I think the obvious place to look is 2000, but, but the place that historians look is the, the election of 1844. And in that election, there are two major candidates running, Henry Clay for the Whigs and James K. Polk for the Democrats. And, um, and Polk is 
unabashed about the fact he wants to spread human enslavement across the country. Clay does not want to, although he himself is a human enslaver, he is going to end up getting getting um, his emancipating his enslaved neighbors and um, and was working to get rid of human enslavement and not to spread the institution. But in that year, um, a group of voters in New York who um, who refused to accept the idea of voting for anybody who supported enslavement in any way, bled enough people away from Clay that the election went to Polk. And what that meant, of course, was the spread of human enslavement and eventually the American Civil War and all the problems that came from that, because those few voters there in what was known as the Free Soil Party in New York, especially, took about 4,000 votes. And those votes ended up, of course, changing the course of American history. In this particular election, when we actually have democracy at stake, this is not the election to, to vote for a third party, is what people like me have said. That doesn't mean I'm against third parties in general. It's that what I'm really interested in is the way politics and mechanics work and how that is applicable in, in different scenarios, in this case, to this particular election. All right. So um, um, now, I mean, one of the things that jumped out to me, as I said, was how nervous people seemed in their questions and how the questions themselves were really, really amorphous, if you will. So I'm going to try and put them off the top of my head into some sort of a pattern because something really is jumping out to me these days. That is, it feels like there are major pieces in play. It is not clear how the game is going to turn out, but those major forces that are in play are not ones that are easily turned, uh, and they speak against those who are trying to destroy democracy. So what do I mean by that? First of all, um, basically what I'm saying is it feels as if the tide against the last 40 years of American politics anyway has turned. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna express that in a little bit more general way in just a second. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a look first of all at the interpretations that we have seen around us since the 1990s of the Second Amendment. That's the amendment that protects the right to, to bear arms. Hawaii, the, the Supreme Court of Hawaii has recently come out with a decision attacking the expansion of those Second Amendment rights under uh, Justice um, Scalia, Antonin Scalia, in the Bruin decision, um, which I, off the top of my head, I'm going to go with 1992, but that could really be wrong. Someone might want to throw it in the chat. Um, that decision, the Bruin decision, was enormously important because what it said was that um, individuals have themselves a right to bear arms. That's actually not what the Second Amendment was written to do and not the way it had ever been interpreted before. And, and the answer to how it was written and how it was previously interpreted was that the, the government did not have the right to impinge on the right to bear arms. It was a way to hold the government back, not to give rights to an individual. And that sounds like it's the same thing, but it's really not. Once you have given individual rights to do to, to, to gun ownership and, and unrestricted rights to gun ownership, it has given us this explosion of, um, of uh, guns into um, into individuals' hands, as opposed to the idea that the government has the right to regulate guns. So the state of Hawaii, the Supreme Court of the state of Hawaii came out and said, you know, this interpretation is simply wrong. At the same time, not literally at the same time, but within, you know, a little bit of a few days, uh, weeks or so, um, Mexico has is has gotten the go ahead to sue United States gun manufacturers for what they, it argues is a, a, a deliberate plan, a marketing plan, to put guns into the hands of their cartel um, operatives, and that has gone. That can go ahead now. Now I'm not a lawyer, but lawyers say that this could be a game changer in the marketing practices of the gun manufacturers in the United States. Why am I setting that up as a as a tide change? The fact that the United States has this is a wash in guns 
and is literally losing its people every single day to gun violence is, is head exploding. If you step back and take a look at it, a democracy should not be a, a suicide pact, as people say. And the, the vast majority of Americans, more than 80 percent of us, want to see common sense gun safety legislation. And of course, we haven't been able to get it, not any longer because of the NRA. It was originally the National Rifle Association that in the 1970s switched to have uh, basically went from a gun safety organization to a gun manufacturer's organization. And for the first time in 1980s supported its a president, which is Ronald Reagan, and really pushed this idea that everybody needed to have guns. Well, now, of course, the NRA is, um, and, and it supported a lot of Republican politicians. Now the NRA is itself in terrible financial trouble and its former president, Wayne Lapierre, is in in trouble himself in legal trouble himself the the organization seems to be hollowing out so why are the republicans still pushing the idea of um uh, the the idea of, of making sure there are no regulations on guns when only less than 20 percent of us want th to have this this free for all. And the answer to that I think is in part because now they are beholden to their followers who have internalized this idea that they, with their guns, are the true protectors of the American government. But I'm not sure that's going to continue to have traction. I mean, the fact that you have these this this legal decision and this lawsuit going forward, and the you know more than eighty percent of us saying enough is a freak enough, suggests that that which as recently as fifteen years ago was considered sacrosanct in the country, considering that's on the ropes, I think that's a really big deal, and I will write about that at some point. Um, but that's one of the things I see. The other thing that I've seen in the last couple of days is the fact that um, that even Republicans are now admitting that the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, has been a great success. They're calling, some of them, in fact, are calling to expand it. This is after years of saying that that law, of course, passed under Democratic President Barack Obama was socialism, was going to destroy the country. They are now saying, hey, it isn't such a bad idea. And they're saying that because Americans like it. And under Joe Biden, they have signed up for it in very large numbers. And Biden has also, um, under the the uh, Inflation Reduction Act has enabled Medicare to negotiate with the big pharmaceutical companies that are charging exorbitant prices for very commonly used drugs in the United States. We are, until very recently, with the Affordable Care Act, the only uh, advanced nation in the world that didn't in some way negotiate with pharmaceutical companies or simply cap how much money they were allowed to charge us. That's a really big change, too, that people are admitting that the Affordable Care Act is actually a good thing. One of the stories that you see everywhere in the news nowadays is that Americans are finally coming around to realizing that the economy is good and that Biden has worked very hard to make ordinary Americans have more money, which he has. Inflation has indeed been a problem, but it's been coming down now for the last more than a year, I think it is. And at the same time, wages have gone up more than inflation so that for all the fact we don't like what the, the prices we're paying in the supermarket, we're making more money to cover that for the most part. And we also have the problem, of course, of greedflation, uh, which is the idea that certain corporations are quite openly um, raising their prices as high as they say the market can bear, even though that does not reflect increases in their production costs or anything else. And they're simply giving that money back to their stockholders. And that's something that um, that you know most Americans don't really like, but um, but that is really driving inflation in the United States, and people are more and more aware of that. Um, people are also paying attention to the, the fact that the investments in the Inflation Reduction Act in climate change are creating jobs around the country, as many as 1.5 million for the next 10 years going forward. And that's starting to get teeth. It's starting to show up. And people are recognizing that. At the same time, they're also seeing um, seeing more jobs and more improvements thanks to the, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. That's not actually its name. It's it, The word jobs is in the title of that act as well. 
And finally, the place that um, that really was was hitting the Biden administration, with one exception I'll talk about in a minute, is uh, immigration and the border. And when the Democrats said to the Republicans when they were negotiating over the National Security Supplemental Bill, and the Democrat the Republicans said, you know, we're not going to pass that bill unless you pass border security legislation. And and for four months. Um, um, Oh my God, the Connecticut senator, the Democratic Connecticut senator. I can see him, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on him, Chris. Anyway, a Democratic senator, um, Kirsten Cinema of Arizona, an independent, and um, uh, James Langford of Oklahoma had um, uh, had negotiated for four months. They had stayed through Christmas. They'd stayed through Thanksgiving. They had they had really created, uh, you know, worked really hard to create this bill that actually favored the positions of the extreme Republicans, not the Democrats. And Biden came out and said, I'm 100 percent for it. Um, we need to get this uh, a national security supplemental through. Let's go ahead and pass it. And then Trump stepped in. Thank you, Chris Murphy. Thank you, Bobby. Um, um, uh, and then Trump st stepped in and, and had the Republicans kill the bill. That has enabled the Democrats to say, listen, we would love to take care of the border and you are not permitting us to do that. So that has also been defanged. And all of those things, I think, are are starting to 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 roll forward. And with that, um, you know what I'm going to do? Um, um, Oh, the, and the other piece uh, that, that is really striking is that although the Republicans are trying very hard to make it much more difficult to vote, and again, I'll write about that in the future, there have been significant wins for the Democrats. That is by electing Janet Protasiewicz to the Wisconsin Supreme Court last year, they have just now um, approved new maps in Wisconsin. They still favor the Republicans, but not the way the old ones did, which were so ferociously gerrymandered the Democrats basically didn't stand a chance at controlling the state house, um, even though they they routinely elected a Democrat as governor. Um, so there have been wins like that as well. Now, um, actually, maybe I will talk about it now. Now, the one thing that is uh, really problematic, I think, right now for the Biden administration and that people are justly upset about is, of course, the crisis in the Middle East. And once again, I keep saying about this, Biden's first goal was to make sure that crisis did not spread. And so and it's really important to pull that piece out. And, you know, you know me, I'm all about lanes. If you pull that piece out, what you see is is why the U.S. sent two um, carrier groups to the to the region, uh, why they have struck 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 at the Houthis who were attacking the shipping that was going through um, through the shipping lane there, and that really mattered because if the international ships couldn't go through that that lane, they had to go around the continent instead, and that both would make things much more expensive, but it was also threatening grain to Africa, and that's always something to remember and to keep in in mind that, you know, sometimes you see, oh, the Americans are just mad about it. it's going to cost shipping a few more dollars. Anytime shipping is is endangered, and maybe I shouldn't say anytime, almost anytime shipping is endangered, the first thing that gets hurt is grain going to Africa. And, and Africa needs grain because of its young population and the fact it needs, it, 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 it's a booming population and it needs to be able to feed that population, especially in the face of climate change. So the, I, you know, by, by, by hitting those ship, those shipping lanes, what was at stake was among other things, the feeding of Africa. And that's, you know, whenever you, for me anyway, whenever I hear international crises, the first thing I think about is what's happening to the grain going to Africa, because the crisis that is that could happen there is always overwhelming. OK, so that's what the administration was trying above all to do is make sure that Hezbollah, which is the non-state actor in Lebanon, the Houthis, the non-state actor in, in uh, Yemen and Hamas, um, also a non-state actor, was to make sure that 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 
war did not spread because if that war spread, the United States had two options. It could try and walk away, but Israel is an ally and it could get, uh, get dragged in much more thoroughly. And always remember that the president's job we tend to forget this because we've lived safely for so long. The president's job is to try and protect the United States. For all that we are this the, the elephant in the room and all that, that's the president's job. Okay, so take that piece out. So far, always dangerous to say this, but so far that piece has worked. The crisis has not so far spread. But that leaves the 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 you know, put a lid then, if you will, over Hamas and Israel. Now, remember that Israel is a country. Its government is run by Benjamin Netanyahu, who is a far-right extremist and who is in real trouble in his own country for fraud and is facing um, facing legal, you know, uh, uh, lawsuits. He's in legal trouble. Okay, so there is that. And then there is the fact that there was a ceasefire, which is very complicated, by the way, between Israel and Hamas, which runs Gaza on October 6th. Hamas broke it very dramatically with this all out attack on Israel in which they not only slaughtered a bunch of people, including committing um, uh, sexual violence as a weapon of war, which actually matters, and, um, and also took hostages. That's a war crime. OK, so that's out there. Now, as you know, or maybe you don't know, but now what happened was that Israel was sort of caught flat footed. Netanyahu was caught flat footed. He said that, you know, his whole claim to power was that he had kept Israel safe and all of a sudden that had just gone up in flames. So his cabinet, which is a far right cabinet, insisted that it was going to isolate Gaza altogether and keep out all food, water and electricity power until... Uh, until the hostages were returned. And that 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 issue of the fuel is really important because Gaza depends on desalination stations that provide water, all right? So if you remember, and this goes way back, but if you remember, um, uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken went quick as a bunny over there to the Middle East, talking not only to Israel, but to Arab states in the area, trying to get aid into Gaza. And eventually they traded aid going into Gaza for a visit from um, President Biden. So the idea that Biden has done nothing is um, is belied from the very beginning. He has tried incredibly hard to get aid into Gaza. But Netanyahu seems anyway to have used this excuse of, not excuse, used the attack on Israel to just do everything he can to, to hammer the Palestinians who live in Gaza at the same time that Israeli um, settlers are moving into the West Bank, which is another, another part of the region over there, um, illegally, by the way. So, so this has continued to escalate. And the, the, the question now is, how is it gonna, gonna, gonna fall out? Because Netanyahu is increasingly really just, just um, refusing to accept anything that the, that the Americans say at the same time that, um, that you know, the, the devastation in, the, in Gaza is, is unthinkable. So what's happening? What's the larger picture? What's the end game? The end game, according to the Arab states, remember the, the people who are doing the attacking are non-state actors. That's important to remember. You know, they're not, they're, um, I don't want to make explicit American connections, but they're, they're, not, they're not the governments of those countries. The, the Arab states the United States and now a number of European countries are explicitly calling for a two-state solution. That is finally putting in place the Palestinian state, the Palestinian nation that was designed from the beginning but that has never come to pass. Um, Israel is hair on fire over this and saying that that would, re that would reward Hamas for attacking it to begin with. Hamas also does not want the idea of a Palestinian state because both the Palestinian state and Israel would have to have security guarantees. 
The Arab states have said that if, in fact, this comes to pass, they will pour money into Gaza to to rebuild it. So as you're watching this, um, and and everything right now in this moment, is, is it a hair trigger? Uh, in all of these countries, not only in Israel, where Netanyahu is extremely unpopular, not only in Gaza, where you know tens of thousands of people have died and are suffering, and who are getting aid, but it's never nearly enough, especially in with disease and all the things that happen when your infrastructure breaks down. But the Arab states as well are facing revolts from their streets, who look at what's happening to. Um, to the Palestinians and are furious at not only Israel, but also the Americans and Western governments that have supported that. With everything in a hair trigger, something is going to give. And the Americans, I think, the, the Biden administration, because the, the Trump administration is, is very pro Netanyahu, they would be have been willing to just pave over Gaza. Um, the Biden administration and its allies, it seems to me, are really, really, really pushing for this two-state solution. And whether or not they can pull it off, I mean, it's interesting. Whenever I try and explain this stuff, everybody keeps saying that I'm that I'm defending Biden. I'm trying to figure out where the pieces are moving. I have no idea if they can pull it off. I don't know anything about these countries. As somebody who's 61 years old, and has seen these, you know, the troubles over there for a long time. It it seems like it's a tight wire act at the very least, but it also would be absolutely a game changer. So one of the things that interests interests me right now is that nobody who is screaming for a ceasefire, which would of course leave Israel exactly in charge of where it is, and Hamas for that matter, is not talking about a two state solution because that seems to me to be almost. Uh, um, it's, it's a, certainly a far better deal for the Palestinians. So anyway, that's what I'm watching over there. And I don't have any idea how it'll play out in the U.S. election. I think anybody who thinks that Trump will be better to the Palestinians than Biden is is delusional. But I also understand that this is um, a huge problem. And whether or not the Biden administration has handled it well or not, the only reason that I have to have faith in them is because they do seem to have such a good handle on international relations altogether. Um, there are more and more articles about what they're trying to do. And, um, and I have no way to judge whether or not it's a better, whether it's going to work. It does seem to be a better place than where we are now. All right. So if that's on the one hand, I said I was going to talk about, um, about um, uh, how things seem to be changing. Um, I think that it's really important right now to recognize um, that on the one hand, you've got the, the attempt of governance by the Biden administration. And on the other hand, things are increasingly becoming clear um, that the Trump move, the Trump movement, uh, it poses a real danger to the world, and it poses a real danger to the world in um, uh, by at this point explicitly attacking the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, that thing that Biden and Blinken managed to nail together in 2021-2022, uh, has underpinned world um, security since it went into effect in 1949. And what it is, is a series of alliances now with 32 different countries that are, uh, that underpin the idea of, um, of sort of a backstop against, it was it designed to be against um, the aggression of the Soviet Union and now of course stands against Soviet aggression. Without that pact that 32 countries will, will stand as one if any is attacked, if that indeed falls apart the way that Trump is indicating he will do, what that means is that the, the major, the big countries in the world, and at that point that looks like China, the United States, and, and maybe Russia, will be able to pick up basically satellite comp satellite countries and take them over going forward. And that's something that the United States stands firmly against. So when Trump has come out and, and increasingly attacked it, 
right as it becomes clear that Russia is desperate for something to help them out of the problem they've gotten into in by attacking Ukraine, first in 2014 and then again in 2022. That, I think, has woken a lot of people up to recognize that, you know, really, if we tear apart NATO and if we don't support Ukraine so we enable Russia to pick up those oblasts that it wants and eventually the industrial sections of Ukraine and eventually essentially to rule Ukraine entirely, that that will really affect the entire world. And it really opens up the possibility for World War III. That happening right at the same time that um, uh, that Russia quite deliberately murdered Alexei Navalny, the leading uh, political um, uh, the leading political opposition figure, I think has woken a lot of people up. For the the House of Representatives, you know, so I read something the other day. It said, "Oh, Congress hasn't gotten anything done in ten years," and I thought, I don't know where you've been. The Congress under Biden in his first in in the first Congress under Biden, the first two years of his administration was the most effective Congress that we have had probably since the the LBJ's first term in the Great Society. Nancy Pelosi was a House Speaker at the time. She ran that place like we have virtually never seen in our history, and they passed game changing legislation: the American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, Gun Safety Legislation, Violence Against Women Act. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act that invested in climate change, the um, the um, uh, Chips and Science Act, huge investments there in technology, bringing s- supply chains home. I mean, it was enormously effective. And then we get this Republican House, which is a Republican House by a very slim margin, in part because there were at least three states that had illegal, illegally gerrymandered maps in place during the election. Their own state Supreme Courts found those maps um, unconstitutional. And and Kevin McCarthy basically couldn't get anything through when he was Speaker of the House because he had this rump group of extremist MAGA Republicans who refused to to agree to anything that um that 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 needed to happen. In fact, if you think about the passage, for example, of the debt ceiling, which is one of the first things he had to do, the raising of the debt ceiling. At that point, he cut a deal with Biden to to for a certain reduction in in budgets, and they from from then on said we're not going to do anything you want unless you cut that by even more. And so, of course, they end up throwing him out. Um, apparently, Matt Gates was behind that, and and McCarthy is now pretty openly saying that's because Matt Gates is in trouble for um, uh, w- w- that that sexual case that was against him. Uh, you know, for for having um, uh, 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 sexual relations with somebody with a, uh, I think an underage girl. I can't remember quite what it was. That's back on the table now. Um, but he got got thrown out for the first time in our history, and they had to um, to to find a new Speaker of the House in the middle of the term. And of course, they turned to Mike Johnson, a Republican of Louisiana, who had who was, had very little experience in anything. And now it turns out this guy who's a Christian nationalist with very little experience, is holding up the National Security Supplemental Bill that would provide aid to Ukraine in its war against Russia. And that has horrified, I think, not only um, people who more generally were concerned about Ukraine, which I have been since the beginning, but um, but even, you know, Mike Pence came out, swing, he was uh, Trump's vice president, came out swinging this weekend, going past the stupid bill. Um, you also see, uh, obviously, Liz Cheney, the former Republican from Wyoming, Bill Kristol, uh, formerly a neocon, people coming out and saying, pass the stupid bill. And meanwhile, um, Mike Johnson went, put the House on recess for two weeks. It was already scheduled, but he could have he could have said no. Um, a day early because the MAGA Republicans aren't even letting him pass pass procedural bills. And after the um, the assassination of Navalny on Friday, um, he didn't say anything for days until yesterday he came out having gone to visit Trump in um, apparently at Trump's golf course in Florida and um, and came out with a thumbs up sign and uh, and clearly is making no effort at all to fund Ukraine, which means, of course, that 
Russia is making advances for of all, across the land that the um, that the Ukrainians had taken back over the course of the last year. So I think this has woken a lot of people up, and and it it really made people come out as Liz Cheney did um, this weekend and said the the Republican Party has a Putin wing. It has a wing that is actively working to destroy democracy. That's that's a big deal. And I think it is finally now on the table. I think it, personally, I think this has been there since the 2016 election. And I wrote about that the other night about how it was thanks to Paul Manafort's management of Trump's 2016 campaign that he managed to get elected. Um, but, you know, Trump pretty pretty effectively defanged that by always talking about, oh, your Russia, Russia, Russia thing that never really happened. Well, it did. You know, even now, and I'm sure I'll get notes about this, even now people write to me and say, oh, you have Trump derangement syndrome. He had nothing to do with Russia. That is literally not what is in either the Mueller report or the Senate Intelligence Committee report. And the Senate Intelligence Committee was, was dominated by Republicans when they said, yes, Manafort was working with his Ukrainian part, business partner, partner uh, Konstantin Kalimnik, who is a Russian operative. He was actually feeding him that information during his polling information during the 2016 campaign and feeding it uh, to, to Kalimnik, who was working with uh, directly with uh, a Russian, who was himself a Russian operative working directly with, um, with some of Putin's people. So that's been there a while, but I think it is now on the on really on the table for a lot of people. And how is that going to play out? Well, one of the things that that I'm watching and I'm I'm really interested in is Trump's whole claim to author to being an authoritarian, which is obviously what he's going for, is that he has to look like a strong man. A strong man can never look like a loser. They always have to project that they are going to take everything over. And I've said this to you before, that a right wing reactionary movement, political scientists will tell you, never gets more than about 33% of the vote tops. That's the top level. They are always a minority. The way that they get everybody else on board is by threatening them. So they're frightened. And certainly the Trump loyalists are doing that. You're watching um uh, Republicans who are not Trump, not, you know, fervent Trump supporters leaving the House of Representatives saying they will not run for re-election. You're seeing if it, officials within the state saying that they are frightened by the Trump supporters who are threatening them or threatening their families. You're, you saw Jim Jordan trying to take over the speaker's uh, um, chair during the fight uh, over that speaker's chair by saying, um, you know, people said they were being threatened to get behind Jim Jordan. You're certainly seeing that. But while they are trying to project that idea that they can, that they are so strong and they can threaten people, Trump's world is falling out from under him. You know, he now owes over a billion dollars in penalties and fines, over a billion dollars. Somewhere he's going to, um, to have to, to come up with that kind of money. Um, and that, of course, is going to make him vulnerable. But one of the things that that has done, I think, is first of all, he's making mistakes. He is just pouring stuff out on Truth Social that, that looks really unhinged. That's hardly anything new. But he also made a really interesting error this weekend after the decision was handed down um, that, that was an additional 454, I think, million dollars. I mean, these are astronomical sums, sums of money. Um, he went to sneaker con in in Philadelphia. And one of the things, one of the ways that Trump always projects that he has all this support is, you know, if you if you watch his rallies, you see they're much smaller than they've ever been, but they wall them off so they look full. Um, he always speaks to hand-picked groups. And we know, for example, when Biden went to and stood on the UAW picket line, Trump actually, we know this from his financials that were released recently, actually rented space at a rival plant and hired people to stand there as if they supported him, as if they were union workers. They weren't at all. This is what he does. He stages a reality. 
that itself is is part of a, of a technology for moving people so that they believe something that isn't real. But he's very careful about his audiences and making sure he's in specific places. And this weekend, he didn't do that. He tried to sell those sneakers, these $399 sneakers, um, to not to his not to his people, not to his MAGA supporters, but he went out in public to a group of uh, younger people at SneakerCon, which is a convention of you know sneaker aficionados. And while he was there, he got booed and people started yelling, let's go Biden at him. So he really couldn't speak. That was a really interesting misstep because he looked uncool. He looked like a he looked like a loser. He had people literally laughing and chanting, "Let's go Biden!" at him, um, and he couldn't tell the you know his his secret his secret uh, I mean not a secret his his security people to knock them down the way he did in 2016 and and he it was a really interesting move and I thought one that indicated um, that he. He is slipping, and I don't mean, I mean, he's definitely mentally slipping, but if I'm talking about this shift that I'm seeing, one of the things that you, that I'm watching for is vulnerability in, 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 in Trump. And, you know, Nikki Haley today pulled a real surprise move in that she basically tricked the Fox News channel into... Uh, covering a speech of hers live, and it was an attack on Trump. They they pretty clearly thought that she was um, she was going to withdraw from the race, and instead she just came out swinging. And that's sort of like all of a sudden pieces feel like they're moving. Like I said, but the really big piece for me, and that people are finally starting to pay attention to. There's this article in the New York Times. Uh, I've lost track of days, as I always do, recently, today, yesterday, something, that said that the resistance is, is, is exhausted, resisting Trump. And I thought that was really interesting because, in fact, for the last many years, people have been coming together quietly amongst themselves, um, sort of saying, this is not the country I want. And that's not just Democrats at all. That's Republicans who cared about the party the way it used to be, that's independents who are horrified by one thing or another that the extremists are doing. And it's certainly Democrats, but it's people who are looking at the Project 2025, for example, this outline for a new authoritarian administration that is articulately anti-democratic. That is, you're going to get rid of the of the nonpartisan civil service and put loyalists in its place. You're going to take control over the Department of Justice, take control over the military. Um, 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 uh, deport, uh, you know, Trump has said that he is going to deport 10 million people living in the United States. And that is not, by the way, just undocumented immigrants or asylum seekers. He is also talking about going after birthright citizenship, which is um, the citizenship for people who were born in this country and has been established since uh, 19, I'm sorry, 1898 in our country, and which, um, which is not only an attack on birthright citizenship, it also is a declaration that the president can himself decide what the amendments in the constitution stand for. The president has the right to decide what what, what legal interpretation of the constitution is. That's the end of democracy right there. That's it. That's a whole new thing. People are paying attention to that and saying, stop. You know, this is not what we want. We might not agree on well, anything, to be honest. We might not agree about immigration. We might not agree about foreign policy. We might not agree about finances. We might, and by the way, my, my, my stand on the finances is often quite different than people think it is when I talk about historical bases. We might not agree on any number of things, but we can agree that the way we solve those things is through democratic systems. And what Trump and his people are doing are destroying democratic systems. So, um, um, one of the things that has really jumped out to me in the last few days is the death of Alexei Navalny. And that is, you know, one of the things that, let me step back a little bit. 
one of the things that it, you, you, you must know about me by now, I believe that we change society by changing ideas. And one of the, the, the big things for me was when, um, you know, I had t talked about American principles for a long time, but I'm, you know, I'm a Facebook person, right? Or, or whatever. I'm a historian. During Trump's first hearings about his first impeachment, when Alexander Vindman gave that speech about here right matters, I felt like that was a that was a turning point in our history. That is that from then on, um, Adam Schiff, who was the impeachment manager, the head of the House Intelligence Committee at the time, uh, from an, a representative from California, in his uh, prosecution of Trump in the Senate, in the Senate trial after he was impeached, kept talking about principles. And then we had Alexei, I'm sorry, then we had um, um, Volodymyr Zelensky. When the Russians moved in in February 2022, I think it, it looked like what was going to happen was what has happened when other countries get taken over, their government runs away and becomes a government in exile. For example, like the Afghanistan government is right now. Officially, the Taliban is not in charge of Afghanistan, although in de facto it is. There is an official Afghan government that is outside this, 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 the, the country. And it looked like that's what was going to happen with Navalny. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I keep saying that with Zelensky that the Ukrainian government was going to skedaddle and be a, a government in exile from a, from a Western country. And when Volodymyr Zelensky and his cabinet in the first few days of the war did, took a selfie in the streets of Kyiv, and he said, I, the, the U S government said to him, we can, we can, we can fly you out. And he said, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. That was a game changer. It was truly a game changer because what he was saying is, I'm going to go down with this ship or I'm going to right this ship, which makes it enormously ironic that they are now missing ammunition and nobody seems to be there to give it to them, including us, um, especially us. But that was really a game changer. And the other thing was when Alexei Navalny went back to Russia after Putin had tried to poison him a number of times, but, but almost killed him. He went back because he said it was worth it to fight for that country. And in this moment after his murder, and, and mind you, that's not just to be clear here, you know, there were issues with Navalny's, uh, political stances, as there are issues with um, Volodymyr Zelensky's, as there are issues probably with mine and everybody else. So that's not to say that they are, you know, perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But when Navalny went back because he cared about his country, that mattered. So now that he's been murdered, I think that there was the belief perhaps on the part of Putin, who's nervous at home because people don't like this war and the sanctions are really biting and it's been it's very expensive. He's had to turn both to North Korea and to China for additional support, both in money and munitions. Um, he thought that he would cow his opponents. And Navalny's widow, Yulia Navalnaya, came out just days after, she, she spoke the day after Navalny was murdered at the Munich Security Conference and said, this is not acceptable. But she came out a couple of days later in just this, this, this barn burning video in which she said, I'm taking his place and, and we're gonna fight for this country, meaning in this case, Russia, we're gonna bring this guy down. And today she came out and she urged uh, the European Union, not to recognize the results of his election. You know, one of the things when I talk about the tide turning, as I said at the beginning of this, is what the, the moment we're in now, in the United States anyway, and, and mind you, my, my, my perspective is always the United States, is one where we have to choose whether or not we are going to defend American democracy and defend the institutions of our democracy and our safety worldwide, including institutions like NATO, or whether we are going to accept the rule of people like Mike Johnson and Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump 
and Steve Miller and whether we're going to have cars, you know, um, um, what they call internment camps, which are basically prison camps, whether we're going to do that in the United States or not. And I don't think the, the resistance to that is exhausted, like that article said. I think that we have been quietly putting it together now for years. And if we hadn't been, we would have met this moment with um, with terror because all, you know, there all this stuff going on. But but think about it. Like, you know now that there are millions of people working with you. And I don't think that has really sunk in to the pundits yet. But as I'm looking at timing, because so much comes down to timing, I'm looking at the next nine to 10 months as ones where we really express the our, our, our belief in democracy and our determination to fight for democracy without necessarily agreeing with everybody in, in this coalition. That's the whole beauty of it. And that reminds me overwhelmingly, as I've said before, of the 1850s and how when it seemed like the elite enslavers were going to take over the country and then the world, Americans, all of whom were were the only people who could vote were white propertied men, essentially, said, no, that's not what we want to do. And I don't I don't see why we can't do that again. I also feel like that momentum is building. And it's it it's been a while coming, let me tell you, but it feels like that momentum is building. And and this weekend where we had Navalny's execution. Um, the fact that the Russians are beginning to make gains in Ukraine, the the fact that Mike Johnson has refused to let the House bring up this piece of uh, legislation that virtually everybody in America thinks is incredibly important. That is, more than, about 75% of Americans want that legislation to pass, um, including lawmakers. The fact that Trump is attacking NATO, it feels like the rubber is meeting the road. And and I am looking at the fact that that movement in the United States is led by a guy who is hawking gold sneakers and being told and being booed out of existence or being booed off the stage. I have a hard time seeing this as a losing proposition. All right. Um, thank you for being here. I, uh, I will um, see you probably tonight. And I um, in my letter. And I uh, and we'll we'll make this happen. Uh, do remember to to tell people about these audio things because I don't remember to advertise them, and um, and I think they're pretty good. And certainly, my goal going forward is to spread facts everywhere in the next several several months. Because you know what, if all goes according to plan, and we do claw back this democracy from those who are trying to destroy it, think of me getting to just knit and kayak for like a year. Wouldn't that be like a goal? It certainly would be for me. So, um, so tell people about those and I'll try to keep them coming. Thank you for being here.